Hi there, and welcome back to 19th Century Art. In this lecture, we are going to look at the caricatures of Britain and Germany and how they develop into this dynamic, moving picture story we now call comics. To begin with, I want to look at Punch Magazine, which had a very long history from 1841 all the way till 1992 and had a brief attempted revival from 96 to 2002 but ultimately it closed its doors for good at that time. Punch magazine became this very important touchstone of British comics and a lot of the language we use to talk about comics comes from this. The name Punch comes from a popular character called Punch that appears in a puppet show. And you can see that in the original cover for the magazine. And here on the left is Crookshank's depiction of the character Punch with his crazy eyes and his hooked nose and his hump back. He is based on a character called Punchinella from the Commedia dell'arte. To begin with, let's look at John Leach's cartoon number one, which he describes as Substance and Shadow. The occasion for this drawing was a competition where artists would submit their cartoons, their preparatory sketches, and the government was holding a competition to decide which art would hang on the walls of Parliament. And so Punch Magazine invited John Leach to create an image of the kind of cartoon which sort of summed up their opinion of this competition, whereby the art on the walls was all about the elite and the well-heeled, whereas the viewers in the hall were all the poor and the indigent. This is called Substance and Shadow. Punch Magazine did a number of these cartoons, as they called them, in parodying various scenes in society around London. And eventually, the word cartoon is no longer used in its original intention as a preparatory sketch. Now only means a humorous image, a satirical picture. And so this is where we get the word cartoon with that meaning. Punch Magazine eventually gave up its more radical uh, leftist humor and adopted a more middle-class tastes and became a veritable institution. There was a table quite famous for its Friday lunches where the staff and editors and artists would gather around and drink lots of wine and eat heavy British food and make jokes about the events of the day, hoping to come up with an idea for the weekly cartoon. And this was something that then would be drawn up and, and featured in the magazine. Richard Doyle's 1849 masthead with color and advertisements, this became the classic image of the Punch magazine for much of the 19th century. And here we see now the character um, no longer a puppet, but a uh, punch, no longer a puppet, but actually this caricature who would promote the magazine with his little dog, Toby. Punch became an extraordinary institution that inspired imitators all across the British Empire, from India, Japan, and Australia, there were, and many others besides, there were attempts to capture the popularity of satirical images as cartoons. And so we can see the way in which British humor began to infiltrate many different parts of the world. One of the more famous uh, series of cartoons that were promoted in Punch attacked the aestheticists. We'll talk more about the aestheticists movement, but here we see Oscar Wilde and being caricatured in his extravagant and flamboyant tastes and this sort of attack on extravagance and eccentricities was the kind of humor that Punch excelled at 
in its main course of humor. Men are all slouching around in this very effeminate manner. This, of course, was highly ridiculed behavior by Punch magazine. Adult cartoons had been struggling after the cool reception that Doré received for his inspired work based on Topfer's picture stories. But a new audience was being developed through compulsory public education. The need for readings that would be available to a new reading public, this pocket literature called chapbooks from about the 1820s, 1860s, and then even cheaper, the penny dreadful, as printing presses got cheaper and the magazines grew more lavish and extravagant, 1830s to 1890s. And so the new audience, these are working class people and children who now needed access to more and more reading material, these pocketbooks uh, could be covering all kinds of different types of stories and songs and poems and information about history and such, and salacious tales of adventure and crime. To combat the rather unsavory elements in pocket literature, there was the Society for the Diffusion of Useful Knowledge took it upon itself to create the Penny Magazine and begin to distribute more sensible and learned topics to the general public. Here we see the Portland vase and discussion about neoclassical tastes being promoted and distributed to the general public through the Penny Magazine. Punch, of course, sent this up, History at One View, arranged expressly with an eye to the Society for the Confusion of Useful Knowledge. This kind of pocket literature being um, so wholly condensed as to be like a peep show. The illustrators and comics involved in the Punch magazine also made many several publications of their own. Gilbert Abbott illustrated by John Leach, created a comic history of Rome from 1851. This is a curiously similar comic to the concept that Gustave Doré attempted with his history of Holy Russia. Uh, the comic history of Rome also shows this sort of barbarism and uh, insane behavior by the Romans. Another kind of publication that was very popular in the British Penny Dreadful were these salacious stories of crime and murder. Sweeney Todd, the demon barber of Fleet Street, was a tale of a barber who took up murdering his clients, giving them an exceedingly close shave, and then taking his bodies and baking them into pies. This became the subject of a very popular musical by Stephen Sondheim. spring Jack was another series of stories that appeared throughout the 19th century. The Terror of London was this character who seemed to have these boots that gave him the power to leap over tall hedges and he was a bit of a vigilante attacking wayward people and uh, going after criminals himself. There are a lot of curious details about spring Jack and his fantastic stories, though it was presented as fact. Much of what occurred in those stories was wholly invented by the writers, artists, and editors of these Penny Dreadful magazines. Part of the art style of the Penny magazines were these miscellany, where they wanted to create the effect on the front cover of multiple things happening all at once. And so this is a panoramic narrative, or as it was called at the time, a miscellany. Each one of these panels 
looks like you would read it like a comic page, but in fact, they're all different news events all happening about this time. And so it's not actually meant to be read in a sequential order. It's merely all in this assembly of miscellaneous bits that come together to create an exciting image for the cover of police news. Sequential stories were growing in sophistication. Early in the 1820s, Jean-Charles Pellerin had a magazine uh, which published individual prints, pages for children's reading. He called it Amage d'Epinal, which was the uh, place of his birth, Epina. And in it, he had early on in the 1820s, four panels per page. And as these pictures became more popular, he increased the number of panels and the sophistication of the stories being told. And we see by the 1860s, we have a full 12 panels per page as the stories become more and more evolved. Notice throughout here that there is a picture and the text is below. And this was really the standard way in which pictures uh, stories were presented. This is similar to the way that Rudolf Topfer presented his sequential images. And there are no speech bubbles in any of these picture stories. In Germany, the Bilderbogen built on this idea of the penny dreadful, and it also would publish uh, sheets of cutout figures and that could be used in a toy theater. Uh, in these Bilderbogen could be formative, they could be games, they could be puzzles, or as I said, these toy theaters were immensely popular. Kids would build these paper stages and put on plays for each other. This became a very widespread practice throughout the 19th century. In Germany, Heinrich Hoffmann was a psychologist who was dealing with traumatized children. And one of the things he had to do was to gain their trust and allow them to tell their story. So he began telling these kids these rather crazy stories. And one day when he was out looking for a gift for his own son, and he couldn't find any story that he thought was worth buying, he bought himself a blank book and began to write down many of the stories that he'd been telling his children patients. And eventually these stories proved so popular with his friends and family that he began to publish them. Thus was born the stories of Struhlpeter, which is Straw-Haired Peter, and published in 1845. In these rather extraordinary and really rather violent images, we hear stories about Struhlpeter, who never combed his hair or cut his fingernails and was really quite a monster or the young girl who was playing with matches and burned alive. And there we see the little kittens crying over their deceased girl. And the story of the rabbit who steals the hunter's gun and shoots back. This is kind of the craziness and fun of children's literature that was becoming newly popular. Stuart Pater is still... Uh, in print today. It is enormously popular in Germany as uh, it captures this sort of anarchy of childhood and the fears and anxieties that children often have about the world at large. It doesn't flinch from representing things in a very dramatic and visceral way. Following on the popularity of Stuhl Peter, the artist Wilhelm Busch took up doing a cartoon about two naughty boys, Max und Moritz, from 1865. And this was a huge success. Wilhelm Busch was an academic painter who was well-regarded in Antwerp and Munich. And, but trying to make ends meet, he began to publish illustrated rhymes for local publications, beginning in 
1858. He did a number of these. And what makes Wilhelm Busch's caricatures so interesting is that he simplifies the figures and he really tries to capture motion, the movement. Here we see a man having his tooth extracted and he is thrashing around with his legs and the way he superimposes those legs creates this really wonderful dramatic motion. He also picks up on the idea of movement, explosions, uh, being drawn out of the water, and the figure is rushing into the sky by these two ducks. It's absurd, it's crazy, but it's so fun to read Wilhelm Busch's comics. Here's how they appear on the page. This is a story of two hungry ducks going after a frog, and the two ducks are fighting each other as much as they are fighting for the frog. Eventually, because the two ducks can't agree on sharing the frog, the frog escapes. The other thing that made Wilhelm Busch so much fun to read was his use of language was very simple, essential, and had this really tight rhyme. Right, die beiden Enten raufen, da hat der Frog gut laufen, and there's this really strong, heavy rhyme scheme to all the language in his picture stories. So here we see the frog eventually escaped, a little battered and bruised, but enjoying a little pipe and peace after his battle with the ducks. So one of the things that Bush did was stories that evolved into a stylized kind of humorous violence. And so the egghead is this scholar who the two young boys are brutally rolling around in a barrel. Unfortunately, they get caught on the barrel and get crushed underneath. And in the end, we see them flattened like a pancake. If any of this all looks familiar to you, it's your Saturday morning cartoons shown again here. The way in which the battle of the ducks and the frog and this stretched out cartoon all give us this wonderful sense of larger than life caricature with motion. And he does a beautiful job of extending the idea of caricature into the comic format to create a really vital and vibrant moving picture. This is wonderfully captured in his story, The Virtuoso, which is done with no words at all, but we just see these two men, one a visitor, the other the pianist, and as he's watching the pianist, his reactions grow in surprise. And as the pianist becomes more and more violent in his piano playing, it becomes more and more distorted and exaggerated until at the end, the piano playing and the audience to the piano playing are both distorted to this incredible degree. Look at the way the hands fly about. Musical instruments scatter through the sky. The audience member's eye just absorbs his whole face. This is wonderfully abstract and strangely bizarre, but it also just emotionally really captures this moment in a very effective way. Now, Wilhelm Busch is most famous for his children stories, but he also got into a lot of adult stories and some which were so adult themed, it actually brought him to a court of law. His work was banned in the Catholic states cities of Germany as he dared to make fun of the Saint Anthony of Padua. And here he has a dream of a ballerina. And and so people thought his drawings altogether too sexualized, even though there was no actual exposure. They just thought the legs were just a little too risque. And I say this because I think the expressive power of his drawings implicated more than they actually revealed. Back in Britain, a new character emerged on the scene on a magazine that was an offshoot of the Punch magazine. They called itself Judy magazine. And Punch magazine and Judy magazine were not related to each other. 
Uh, but Judy Magazine followed the format of Punch, but instead of going toward male, middle-class tastes, Judy Magazine was creating an image of itself as more focused on lower middle-class values. They created a character called Ali Sloper that proved very popular indeed. Ali Sloper was probably based on Robert McNair by Daumier, who we talked about in a previous lecture. And it was similar in the fact that it was a character who was a low-class figure, who was a shyster and a charlatan. The name Ali Sloper was a person who would sneak off down the alley to avoid paying rent. And Ali Sloper got into all kinds of trouble and antics about how he's going to get a deal or make a promise to do something, but then he fails miserably. Charles H. Ross was the man who invented this character, but he had a serious drinking problem, and it was his wife, Emile de Tessier, a French theater actress who created her work under the name of Marie Duval. And it's under Marie Duval's artistic guidance that this character really becomes enormously popular and is centrally featured in Judy magazine. So here we see on December 1st, 1869, we have Ali Sloper in en route to the Suez Canal. We see him with all his uh, adventures in the Middle East. And then we see him off in Africa on August 24th, 1872. Ali Sloper, drawn by Marie Duval, was a really extraordinary experimental comic. She was not a great artist, and she made that a part of the humor. The drawings, as you can see here, are not exceptionally well done, but the way she framed it, it was as if Ali Sloper, this incompetent buffoon, was drawing himself, and that the sloppiness and the absurdity of the drawing was Ali Sloper's own attempt at drawing himself, and he was the artist of his own creation. And so we're sort of seeing the world through his eyes and his own incompetent way of being. Ali Sloper was spun off into its own magazine. And it was sold and created as Alice Sloper's Half Holiday. So we have a comic magazine that is featured Alice Sloper. And this continued in popularity from 1856 all the way to 1888. Unfortunately, the character was passed on to William G. Baxter, who got rid of all of the slightly crazy antic qualities of the illustration and became a more finely polished and finished illustrated magazine that continued all the way until 1923. Humor magazines were growing in popularity in Britain and the man who really cornered the market on all kinds of publications was Alfred Harmsworth who was a, an extraordinarily ambitious publisher who learned that you could corner the market by cutting the costs and vastly increasing your distribution. It was all a matter of scale. So he created comic cuts, you see here, at half a penny, whereas most publications up to this point, the cheapest publications were a penny. So now for half a penny, you could buy comic cuts and had pictures, prizes, and jokes. And most of this material he got, he just pilfered off other publications. Again, copyright law was not strictly enforced, and he would often get things from the United States or from Germany and crudely translate them for his own publication. So Alfred Harmsworth, in his comic, A Cut was the name of a woodcut, which was the wood engravings that were commonly used in these publications. And so it's humorous woodcuts. But in fact, the word comic is what really mattered. And even when 
the woodcut was no longer featured and people exclusively used the new lithographic means for reproduction, the word comic is once stuck. And so it's from this point on we have the word comic in popular parlance to describe humorous picture stories.